Welcome to the third annual Perichoresis Lectures in Australia. This year's series is titled Jesus and the Undoing of Adam and is being held at Table College, Adelaide, November 2000. Our speaker is Dr. Baxter Kruger and this is his third visit to Australia. He is a native of Mississippi and he holds degrees from the University of Mississippi, Reformed Theological Seminary and a PhD from the University of Aberdeen in Aberdeen, Scotland. Lecture 4 is titled, If It Is Finished in Jesus, Why Is My Life Still a Mess? Okay, if you have a Bible with you, I want you to turn to Psalm 22. And if you've got the handout, the printout, there's a section in there called A Note on My God, My God, Why Have You Forsaken Me? I'm not going to be able to cover all of that in, as I wanted to, running out a little bit of time, um, because I want to get to the question, if Jesus has finished it all, why is our life a mess? But give me just a minute or two to address the question uh, on this statement of Jesus, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, because I think if we operate within the legal model, which most of us do by default, because we've grown up in the Western tradition, um, Then we hear Jesus cry on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And whether or not we've actually been influenced by the the, uh, Edwards, you know, sort of strain of thought or not, we still have this notion that God is pouring forth. At that moment when Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? At that moment, the father turns his back upon the son, forsakes him, abandons him, and Jesus suffers. And that suffering on the legal model is interpreted as the punishment for our sins. Now, I've got a real question as to whether or not Jesus was actually saying that or if that's why he was quoting that verse and why, what's going on on the cross. And so when you actually read Psalm 22 and you take the time to read that, you get a quite different perspective on what's happening in Jesus. Now, what if we read Psalm 22 as true Christians? Not with the, the fiery God of perfection and anger in the back of our minds, but with the Father, Son, and Spirit uh, as people who believe in the Trinity. What if we read Psalm 22 in that light? Now, this quotation, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, is a direct quotation from Psalm 22, verse 1. But if we read the whole Psalm, there's a movement. It begins in despair. It moves into struggle and into calling upon the name of God, and it ends in great victory, and not only in victory, but in the most remarkable prophecy at the very end of the ver- of chapter 22. It says, all the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will worship before thee. They will come and declare his righteousness to a people who will be born that he has performed it. Now, the cry of Jesus is on one end of the psalm, and victory is on the other end. Between that cry and that victory is the whole sort of range of human emotion. The psalm begins with, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And, oh, my God, I cry by day, but you don't answer. And so the the psalmist, to the pain of feeling as though God has rejected him, goes the pain that, that, you know, his prayers are just met with stone cold silence. So there's not, so, so what he does, and this is very instructive for us that, that, uh, in the fight of faith, what the psalmist does is he, in essence, looks at his feelings and then he turns and rehearses the history of faith. Okay, here's what he feels. My, it feels like you have absolutely forsaken me, but to you, the father's cry. To you, the father's cried out and you answered. And so he rehearses some of the stories and that imagery of the faithful of Israel calling out to God and God intervening to save. And so he's beginning to get a little bit of hope there. And then he turns again and he says, but I am, I'm, I'm the worm and uh, I'm, I'm despised by the people. In other words, he says, yeah, I see that you're faithful as God to the heroes of the faith, but I'm not a hero. I'm just a regular guy and all the people despise me and they mock me. This is right there in Psalm 22. Not only do they mock me, they sneer and they say, you think God's going to deliver you? <laughs> Go ahead. Cast your life into God's hands and see what happens. See, that's the dynamic of the psalm. He's in pain. He cries out to God. He sees God's faithfulness. But then it's like, wait a minute. I'm not really holy enough or, or faithful enough to think that God's actually going to bail me out. And so he's back in despair again. And all the people around him are uh, shouting and sneering. 
Now, who, who can stand before God and claim that God ought to be faithful to them because of their own faithfulness to God? Although if you listen to the radio broadcast the other night, we actually heard from one of those brothers. Um, but for the most part, if you think that God's going to be faithful to you on the basis of your faithfulness to God, you're in deep trouble. At some point, you are going to crash in despair because you're going to be face to face with your own faithfulness. That's what's going on with the psalmist. Is he's struggling, he's wrestling, and he's, he sees the history of God's faithfulness with the people. He's trying to claim that, but it's not really taken. It's not really, and he's getting all these innuendos from the people. Listen to this. So he cries out one more time. It takes another turn. He cries out, says, nevertheless, nevertheless, no matter what I feel here, nevertheless, you are my God from my mother's womb. I was cast upon you from the day of my birth, the psalmist says. And then in that light, he turns and he cries out to God and he says, do not, this is, this is um, uh, right in the heart of the psalm, do not be far from me, for trouble is near and there is not anyone to help. Many bulls, just, you know, just imagine seeing bulls scraping and snorting. They have surrounded me. They've encircled me. They open wide their mouth at me as a ravening and roaring lion, and I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It's melted within me. My strength is dried up, and my tongue cleaves to my jaws. And you've laid me in the dust of death. And the dogs, the dogs have surrounded me. You ever felt like that? I remember years ago, my, one of my fathers in the face said, Oh, the Psalms, they're so good. And I'd read them and think, what? It's just all, you know, blood and guts and moaning and groaning. What's going on here? And about two years later, I started thinking, Ooh, these are good. <laughs> you start going, you see them, and the dogs have surrounded me. A band of evildoers has encompassed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look and they sneer at me and they divide my garments among them and cast lots from my clothing. Then he says, listen to this. Imagine Jesus hanging on the cross. This is what, but you, O Lord, do not be far off. O Lord, my help, hasten to my assistance. Deliver my soul from the sword, my only life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns of the wild oxen. Answer me. You see what's happened. He begins in despair. Where are you? What's going on? Why have you forsaken me? I don't understand this. He rehearses the faith of his fathers. Then he goes into doubt again. And then he takes his stand. And he says, but you have been my Lord since birth. From the very beginning. And he calls out and he cries out to God. Save me. Do not forsake me. Don't hide your face from me. Not now. And that's what's happening in in the middle of this psalm. He cries out. And then the psalm takes another turn the despair ends and the praise begins i will tell of your name to my brethren verse 22 and 24 in the midst of the assembly i will praise you listen to this for he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted neither has he hidden his face from him but when he cried to the lord he heard Now, Psalm 22 moves from agony to God's victorious intervention to a prophecy that somewhere down the future, the whole, the families, all the families of the nations are going to turn and see this event as the salvation of the Lord of hosts. You see that movement? Now, my question is, why did Jesus quote this psalm? And I was thinking, you know, the song, there she was just walking down the street. You know that song here? You know, if I can sing it, you can sing it. You know, that song, you see what happens is we hear certain tunes, we hear certain notes, hear certain words, and the whole song starts playing in our heads. Well, the Jewish nation had this psalm memorized. So Jesus is hanging on the cross and he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That sets the tape running. And so they're sitting there, if they're paying attention, the tape's going to run And so what Jesus is doing is interpreting this event. He's telling all those people, let me tell you what's happening here. You see me here? It looks like the dogs are winning. It looks like the the bulls that have encircled me are going to, the ravening lions are going to win. It looks like God has abandoned me to the abyss and has rejected me. And Jesus is saying, but that's not what's going on here. Not at all. 
What is going on here is not forsaken. There is no forsaken. I'm crying out to my father. And it says right clearly in the text, he did not hide his face when he called. When he called to the Lord, the Lord heard and the Lord saved. So Jesus is running a tape that's actually going to reinterpret the whole event and is going to land Israel standing there realizing that this is the salvation of the Lord of hosts. It looked like God was rejecting Jesus. It looked like he was uh, throwing him and, and, and abandoning him into the abyss. But no, Jesus says, no, no, no. This is not about the, the wrath of an angry God being poured out upon the Son. This is about the triumph of the Father-Son relationship. Far from being a moment when there is a, the Father-Son relation is ripped apart. It's precisely here in the heart of human estrangement and fear. And abandonment that the father-son relation expresses itself and comes to full and abiding fruition in Jesus. Now think this out just a minute. Trying to cover as much as I can in short space. Think this out. Suppose that Jesus not only wanted to send Psalm 22 running in their minds. Suppose that he wanted to send Psalm 23. Also. Suppose we go right on from Psalm 22 and move from that cry of despair to that victory and intervention on God's part, refusing to forsake the Son, and then we read right on into Psalm 23. As you all well know, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He got, and you see, Jesus is hanging. I think what's going on is he's interpreting this. It looks like I'm being rejected, but this is not rejection at all. This is restoration. God's saving that the Father's stepping in and not turning his back on me. He's holding on to me and refusing to forsake me. And then he says, even though I walk through, even though I walk through what? The valley of the shadow of death, I will what? I will what? I will fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. You see that? You see that movement there? It looks this way, but oh no. No, no, no. Don't you think this is what's going on? Don't you think my father's turning my back on me here? That's not what's going on here. What's going on here is I am entering into the darkness and my father will refuse to let me. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. And so what you have in Jesus hanging on the cross is, is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Father, into your hands, I commend my spirit. So you've got this movement in the cross in which Jesus penetrates down into the brokenness of, of Adamic existence. But it's precisely there that he knows and loves his father. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And I'll tell you something else. Suppose, and I don't, I saw this about two, two or three months ago and it took my breath away. But just suppose for a second that Jesus intended in that one statement to jumpstart Psalm 22, and suppose he intended to jumpstart Psalm 23, and suppose that he intended to jumpstart Psalm 24. Do you know what Psalm 24 says? The earth is the Lord's, and all it contains the world and those who dwell in it. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who may ascend to the hill of the Lord? And who may stand in his holy place? He who has a clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood and has not sworn deceitfully, he shall receive a blessing from the Lord. Then skip down to that magnificent verse. Verse 7. Lift, lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. You see where the Psalm 24 turns our attention to heaven and says, lift up. It's got a, a picture of heaven being painted there with the grand doors. And it says, lift, open the doors that the king of glory may come in. So really what you have in Psalm 22, 23, and 24 is the sufferings of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, and the ascension. You see what he's doing there? It's beautiful. Far from being a moment when the angry God shuts the door and turns his back on the son, what's actually happening in Jesus' death is the father refuses to allow him to perish and walks right and holds on to him so that he comes out the other side. A man from the sin-gnarled stock of fallen Adamic existence who comes out in the resurrection who is right with the father and who is lifted up in a sense to the father's right hand. 
And this picture here in Psalm 22 is the psalmist is shouting, lift up your, lift up the, open the doors! Because the sun is coming home. Hallelujah. And he's got the whole world with him. You see that? This is not the end of the father-son relationship. This is the triumph of it. He comes down into the deepest part of despair. And he comes out the other side. And he's got all of us. And he takes us to the father in the ascension. That's what the psalm is telling us. I don't know about you, but it took me a long time to see that phrase that way. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I always dumped in all that sort of legal stuff in it and had the Father giving the Son a whipping. Finally beginning to realize what's really going. This is a shout of victory. This is the victory of the Father, Son, and Spirit relationship, not the end. Now, let me shift gears again. Let me deal with a question that that I think um, all of us want to deal with, and that is, okay, Baxter... We got this. We see our death in Jesus and our resurrection in Jesus and our ascension in Jesus to the Father's right hand. Now, if that's true, why is my life the mess that it is? If I have been lifted up in Jesus and included in the circle of life shared by the Father, Son, and Spirit, then why is my marriage such a mess? Why is my work so boring? Why are so many people so shallow? If I have been lifted, if we have been lifted up, why are the nations so splintered? So how does this happen? What's the problem? If we've been born again in Jesus, why are we living in such enslavement and bondage and darkness and death? See the question? Now I can give you the uh, short answer and then the medium answer and then the longer answer. Um, The short answer is exactly where I started the first night. You remember the first comments that I made to you. The reason you are the way that you are. The reason that you are the way that you are and your life is the way that your life is. Is because God the Father has always wanted to have a daughter like you. God the Father has always wanted to have a son like you. That's why you exist. That's why you're unique. That's why there's so much beauty and glory about you. That's why you are such an awesome person. It's hard to believe, isn't it? That's that angry God. We can't, we got to get him out of the way so we can know who we really are. Now, the other reason that you are the way that you are and that your life is the way that it is is because you do not know. I'm not talking about here. I'm talking about here. Do not know who you are. You do not know the truth, as Jesus said. And because you don't know the truth, you spent your life trying to recreate yourself. And those recreations are disasters. So it's really not complicated. We don't need a whole huge honking theology to explain this. We're included in Jesus, and we don't know it. We're in the dark. Now you think about it. Over here is who we really are. Known, named, claimed, loved, cherished, included, embraced by God the Father Almighty with an eternal hug in the Son, included in that circle. That's who we actually are. Now over here we got who we think we are. Who we believe we are. Now which one of these are we living out of? We, we live instinctively out of what we know and who we think we are and who we believe we are. You see how that works? It's not complicated in that level. It's very simple. It boils down to we don't know. I, I was teaching on this some years ago, and this, this man, he didn't particularly like my emphasis on grace or my emphasis on the finished work of Jesus, and he said, well, Baxter just says the whole world's included and reconciled in Jesus. They just don't know it. And he was making fun of me a little bit, and I thought, that's exactly the problem. You know, Jesus says, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. By implication, he's saying, you don't know it. And if you don't know the truth and you're not free, what are you? You're in bondage. So you see, really what it all boils down to is that we have who we actually are in Jesus Christ, and then we have who we think we are. 
who we believe we are. And we're living out of that belief, uh, or the New Testament would call that, would call that darkness. Let me give you a quick story. Several months ago, I was playing golf back home in a golf tournament for uh, raising money for a ministry that builds houses for people and just builds them from the ground up and gives it to them. It's a wonderful ministry. We had 130 teams, and we're all outside waiting to play, just chomping at the bit. This guy comes on. He does the preliminaries. You know, He says, um, I wanted to thank everybody for coming, blah, blah, blah. And he said, let's pray. And of course, you could have heard a pin. I mean, you just don't really pray before a golf tournament. Most of the time, he prayed. And he went right around the room, Lord, thank you for such a beautiful day. Thank you for the, the, the professional staff that has made this course so beautiful today. Thank you for all the work that they've done. Thank you for the people who are going to be cooking the catfish. For all the work that they've done in preparing that. It's good. <laughs> Better than Vegemite. Where was I? <laughs> he was going right around the room thanking God for everything from the beauty of the day to the hard work that the greenskeeper had put in, thanking God for all the people that were involved in planning and this huge catfish thing, we were, dinner we were going to have afterwards, and even for the greenskeepers. And I was sitting there listening to this prayer, thinking that is a beautiful, beautiful picture. I happen to know the man know where he's coming from. And I didn't get a chance to go and talk to him afterwards, but I had a question for him. How can you, how can you thank God for the people that were putting on that catfish fry when you don't know that they prayed to receive Jesus? How can you thank God for the professional and all the work that he's done? Why thank God for that? Unless somehow you know God's there. Somehow you know that man's participating. And what I saw in this was a, a, uh, a, a dichotomy, a, dual, a gap between our heart theology and our head theology. What he knows in his heart is that those people were participating in the Lord's blessing. So he thanked God for it. But in his head, he can't really say that because he doesn't know if these people have prayed to receive Jesus and whether or not they're really in or not. You see that? That's the difference between what we know here and then what we've got up here. And that's what the the Holy Spirit's bearing witness with our spirits that we are children of God. And we've got this theology and this framework and this pair of glasses on up here that keep us from being able to live in it. Now to go through and, and to go back through our lives and begin to pick this thing apart and turn this framework around is what the New Testament calls what? Repentance change of mind. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. The Spirit is bearing witness with our spirits that we are sons and daughters of God. And we've got such a wrong-headedness about us, we can't really let that go. We're, in essence, stifling who we really are in Jesus. So, on the one side, there's who we actually are in Jesus. On the other side, there's who we believe we are. And you begin to realize that what we're doing is we are operating with what I call the I am nots. Let me diagram this for you just real quickly. What we have here is the soul. And over here we're being addressed and we're being told, I am not. I am not acceptable. I'm not good enough. I am not special. I am not included. I am not going to make it. I'm not inside. I'm not on the team. Not uh, beautiful. You know, you can kind of get going here a little bit. Somewhere I'm going to get everybody before it's over with. <laughs> not worthy. Now, the question is, and I'll sort through some of this in just a minute, but just let me ask you, what happens in soul, inside the soul when someone whispers to you that you're not acceptable and you believe it? What does it produce here? All right, rejection. Fear. 
insecurity, anxiety. Now, all of that that we're talking about in the soul right there is what I call the lethal root. It's back to that sort of cooking imagery again. The onions and all that and you put in and you start. And that, you believe I am not acceptable, it produces rejection, fear, insecurity, and anxiety. Now, what we've got to understand is that whatever is going on in the soul is going to express itself in our body, in our relationships, in our work, in our perspective, in our play. And you just make that list. Let's put marriage and family. Now up here I want to write words, actions, and soul. I think I told this story a couple of years ago when I was here, but it's too good not to tell again. But um, years ago when my wife first and I first got married, I was going to go play golf on a Saturday morning, and I had promised her, forgot about this, but I would promised her that I was going to do something with her. So I had my golf clubs and was going out the door, and she said, hey, um, what about our you know, date? And I thought, well, I really wanted to play golf. So I kind of decided I was going to play golf. It's a young husband kind of thing, you know. And so I left, put my clubs in, and I went, and I was driving to the golf course, and I got halfway there, and I decided, this is not smart. <laughs> so I, I turned around and came home. And I got my golf clubs and walked back in, and I said, Honey, I'm home. I've decided not to play golf. I love you, and I want to spend the day with you. You know, I was like... And she just burst out laughing. And I'm thinking, what, what are you laughing about? And it was in that moment that I came to realize something about human life and human relationships. That human relationships, human fellowship, human interaction involves three things. Words, actions, and soul. Now we live in the Western tradition, which is part of Sir Isaac Newton's closed system and we won't have time to go into all of that except to say that if the universe is like a great watch what's the job of science the job of science is to figure out the mechanics and the principles well and if you take that sort of newtonian picture of the universe and you let that filter in the back door of the church then the whole job of christianity begins to be you figure out the principles you take the principles and you apply the principles to your life so you come up with a new recipe, a new formula, and, you, and that's the way the Christian life is lived. Unfortunately, it doesn't address the soul. It doesn't deal with the soul. What I learned that day was that my wife was plugged into what was going on in my soul. You see, I, I said the right thing. And I did the right thing. But what was proceeding forth with my soul was another message. And she detected that. Now, you see what I'm saying is whatever's going on inside here is going to come out in our relationships with one another, whether we even believe we've got a soul or not. It's not a matter of us pick, you know, reaching in our pocket and pulling out a little plan of here's how to apply. The Newtonian worldview tells us that Christianity is about applying principles to your life. And principles won't work. All you're doing is changing your actions. And Jesus is saying... A river of living water is going to proceed forth from your what? From your soul. That river of living water proceeds forth from your soul, accompanies your actions and your words. And so what people hear, it's not just what you say, it's not just what you do, but it's that spiritual connection in life that flows to them. You see how that works? Now that's, that's the way Christianity really works. God speaks to us, and this lethal root begins to go away. We have hope, and it works its way out into our relationships. That's why I've said every year I've been here, and I'll keep saying it, you show me a man, you show me a man that has genuine peace in his soul, and I will show you a great husband. Not because he's learned principles, because when you have peace, you're still long enough to notice. And when you notice, you can begin to relate. You see how that works? But at the same time, you show me a man that has the lethal rue percolating in his soul, and I'll show you a person who may say the right thing and may do the right thing, but it's a destructive pattern that's at work in their lives. What we're encountering there is not Jesus' river of living water, but really that invisible sort of toxic waste. Let me give you an illustration. A while back, I was playing golf with a friend, 
and his son, and I was playing, and my son, the four of us were playing. And, and on the first tee, I noticed that this um, fella, from, he was from another town, um, but I noticed that he was sort of micromanaging his son. You know, it's like, don't stand that way, stand this way. Let me check your grip out. How are you holding that? How are you standing? Give me a practice swing. And he's doing like, you know, getting the kids, the kids like, you know, and he, and he finally hits the ball. The next shot, the same way. This, this dad's just micromanaging. And I'm thinking, you know, chill out here just a little bit. Let the kid play. Well, this went on for three or four or five holes. Every shot, the dad was lining him up, was holding, telling him how to hold him. Here's your, you know, this trouble on this side. Here's where you play the hole. Look at this. Don't do this. Don't do that. Look this way. And every, after about three or four holes, the kid's just like, hi, ah, this golf thing's for the birds, you know. It's like he almost in tears. And I was watching this whole thing playing out, and I thought, that's the lethal rue. That's what it is. This man does not know that God the Father Almighty has justified his existence. He doesn't know that. So he's operating out of the I am not. It's creating that lethal rue in his soul. So if you've got a man who's anxious, and you start operating with the I am not, what you're going to do is I can become, you fill in the blank, special if I get or do blank. Now, in this case, as I was sitting there watching this whole thing transpire, it hit me that in this case, this man's sort of basic logic of soul was, I don't mean, this is not anything he would ever even know about in his mind. It's all this invisible stuff. He doesn't know God had justified him, didn't really believe that, was not sinking, so he had to justify himself. I am not justified. I can be justified if I am superior athletically. If I am better than the rest of the people around me athletically, then I can have a sense of being justified. But now I've got a son, so if I'm going to maintain my sense of justification by my athletic superiority, my son has to do the same thing because it's obviously we come from the same group. So he's out here just putting all of this pressure on his son to play this great golf game. You see how that works? And he doesn't even know what's going on. Now, what we've done is define sin legally as not fulfilling the law. And what we do is we elect that man to be elder or or deacon of the church because he's not doing anything wrong with what he says or in his actions. But what's proceeding forth out of his soul is completely pressuring his son to the point to where after three or four holes, the the kid doesn't want to play anymore at all. See how that works? Man, people have told me in the past, you know, you don't talk much about sin, Max. It's all about grace. Well, you begin to see this, you begin to understand what sin is. And I, you know, sometimes I will, let me go back to the law, Lord. You know, that's just a few do's and don'ts. This is really getting in the relationship. And I'm beginning to, well, three or four days later, my son and I are playing. And after about four or five holes, I began to realize I was doing the same thing to him. Without even knowing it. I was beginning to put pressure on him to do, play a certain way. Not giving him the freedom to play. I didn't have the freedom to play. And it was going directly out of my soul into his, dominating him. And we finally had a heart to heart. And I said to him in the car, pulled the card over on the side. I said, son, I don't want to do this to you. This is not life. I'm sorry. I do not want to, in essence, vomit my insides onto you and kill you. And that's what's happening. That's what's happening. All of that stuff is coming up and it's going on to my son. It's dominating him. I don't want that. I said, I'm sorry. I want us to be free to play. So you go back at that point and begin to address. Now you've got, I've got four, you know, life, this is life. Every one of us believes I am not in some way, and we all believe that I can become if I get, or I do. Most of us get married that way. Most of us get married out of our I am not, and I can become if I get married. And it's great at first, because... The other person got married the same way, so it's all great, you know. But somewhere down the three, four, five, six years, you kind of wake up and think, well, I got married, but it didn't deal with this. You know, I mean, this is she, she, my wife or my husband. That's not the solution. And that's the first real crisis in most marriages, and that's where most marriages split. Because secretly what you're doing is you're turning to this person saying, fix me, fix me, fix me. I am not, please make me whole. Please make me complete. And for a while it seems to work, but in time, 
You begin to realize this is not working. Well, if I've turned to my wife to fix me, and at some point I realize she's not doing it, what happens? You see what happens. You know what happens. And that's the dynamic in marriage and relationship. I mean, I'm not, I mean, this is all of us. What I know about every one of you is that God has known you and loved you from eternity, saved you in Jesus, and you're in the dark. (laughs) You don't know it. You kind of know it, but you don't know it, and you're living in that, and you're struggling with that. That's the way we all are. And you just kind of go down the list. I am not good enough. I can be good enough if I do this, this, and this. If I get in that religion and if I move up, then I'll be accepted by God. If we get this new program in the church and get this going and get so many people here and get certain kind of dynamics happening, then we'll be acceptable to God. And think of how many people are getting manipulated in this vision. See what I'm saying? It's the same thing. All that stuff coming up out of us and it's going, I mean, that's that's exactly what's happening. We begin to believe I am not. Now where the question is, where does the I am not come from? Well, obviously it doesn't come from Jesus because what Jesus is doing is he's speaking his own I am to us in the spirit. So the I am not is coming from the evil one. So what we have here is the lie. Two, we have our faith in the lie. Three... We have our self-salvation, self-salvation schemes, and we can work on down the list. Actually, what I should have put there in number three is that lethal root. I'm sorry. There you go. That's three, and then this is four. Professorial scribble. We're allowed to do that sort of thing. So the evil one comes in, and he whispers his I am not to us. We don't have enough sense to be able to discern his voice from the voice of God, and we believe it. And that stirs in the lethal root, and it goes to work. Now, my favorite pet illustration of this that's happened in my life is uh, several years ago, I'm sitting at a red light back home in Jackson, and I'm sitting in a 1986 Honda Accord that has been donated to our ministry, and it's got air conditioning, and I'm really excited because the car I had before, the air conditioning didn't work. So, I mean, in Mississippi's hot and humid. So I'm sitting there all excited. It's got air conditioning. And I'm sitting there minding my own business, and this car pulls up beside me. I think it was like a BMW, you know, top of the end, or a Mercedes or whatever. And there's this lady in it. And I'm sitting there just waiting for the light to change. And I happen to look over out of the corner of my eye, and this lady's there, and she goes, (laughs) and turns and drives off. And I mean, it just went, you know, it's, I am not. There it was, the whisper. Coming straight from the evil one. Didn't even use words. Just in a look. Just in a look. Now, I was one mile from my house when that happened. By the time I got to my house, this whole thing had stirred into being. I walked into my house in my attachment mode, in my fix me, fix me, fix me. My children are in there watching TV. They don't even acknowledge that I'm there, so they're not responding to my great need. My wife was cooking supper and on the phone. She didn't really notice I was home. I'm walking in wounded. You know, I am not worried. If I was half a man, you'd have three cars. You'd live in a big mansion. You'd have all this. If you were anybody, who are, you know, and you just nosedive, walk in and you're telling your children, fix me, fix me, fix me. They don't even know you're there. They're watching, you know, some cartoon. And your wife is on the phone and she's cooking supper. And you think, well, well this is great. You know, so I leave and slam the door and go on about my way and drive around the block for 20 minutes and come back in again. We're going to slide in and do it one more time. So I, I walk in, you know, fix me, fix me, fix me. My children turn around and say, hey, Dad, you know, no big deal. My wife looks at him. She says, what's wrong? I said, nothing. <laughs> Nothing's wrong. You know, three days later, nothing's wrong. You see how that happens? Now that begins with an I am not, and it goes in. We believe it. We believe it. It creates the lethal root, and it sends me into this person of great need, what I call a a human vacuum cleaner. I am now self-centered. I am walking into relationships. I am walking into fellowship. I'm walking into wherever I go in my fix-me mode. Somebody please do something to fix me. So now my relationship with my children and my wife is is about me. I'm a long way about being free to even notice what's going on in their world, let alone free enough to give myself to them, which creates fellowship. 
You see how that works? Now that's just like that. Doesn't need to be complicated theologically. Now we can build this whole diagram out into about a 30 hour lecture series, but when it's all said and done, it comes to that. The evil one knows how to whisper into your heart. He knows how to get your attention. He knows what button to push. It may be that he could tell you that you're not included and that wouldn't bother you. It may be that he could tell you that you're not special and that wouldn't bother you. He knows exactly which button to press. And he knows how to press it so that you don't even know he's doing it. It may be through circumstances. I don't know about you guys, but, but I certainly wrestle as the head of the house and trying to you know, provide for my family. I wrestle with finances. And I can count on it at the end of every month that I am not succumbing. You know, if you were half a man, you would not be in this financial situation at the end of every month. And blah, 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 and then just nosedives. You don't even know what's going on. That's what the Bible means by spiritual warfare. You know, we're thinking there's a devil behind everything. You know, a gargoyle going to jump out and get He's just whispering. He's just whispering. He uses circumstances. He uses our wounds. He uses our wounds. I have a friend back home who told me a story. We were talking all about all this, and he said... He said, Baxter, when I was a little boy, my dog died. I love my dog. And he said, I went out in the backyard and buried my dog, and there were six adults in the house, and nobody ever said a word to me. Nobody even ever knew that my dog died. They never came and said, hey, man, it's going to be all right. You know, there's, you read the book of Revelation, there's animals in heaven. You know, nothing was ever said to him, and from that, that was a wound of, you don't count. Your pain at 10 or 8 doesn't count. That's what the message was. That was the wound. And every now and then, it comes up. And that wound comes up and it's whispering, you don't count all over. And it's buried deep. And it's not just a theory that floats in. This is a real, you know, way inside. Only he, the evil one knows, brings that up. You don't count. You believe it. Lethal root, nose dive. And then it's like the whole world is out there for my benefit. Now, the trouble is we can do this for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years. The trouble is the church can do this. You can have a whole denomination built on I am not. It's been going on for 300 years. There's a movie out now in Adelaide called The Kid. Any of you seen it? It's by, uh, it's a Disney movie with Bruce Willis and I forget the kid's name, the young boy. I took my children to see it a while back. Um... And I thought it was being Disney would be kind of a cartoon. And I didn't really have any anticipation of being um, too taken by it or too interested in it. But from the moment I sat down, that movie had me riveted. I am telling you, it's the soul diagram on screen. Now, I don't want to ruin the movie, but let me just tell you a little bit about what happens. Bruce Willis is turning 40 years old. He is a high-powered image broker. His job is to come in when somebody like the prime minister or somebody minister you know, has done something publicly and it's a disaster and they need their image sort of you know, cleaned up. Well, they bring Bruce Willis in. He lays out this sort of marketing strategy and makes it the, public, the, the politicians or the people look good again. And he's also a world class of a rear end of a human being. I mean, the quintessential one. Everybody hates him. He walks in the room and everybody's doing like this, you know. Nobody really wants to have anything to do because it's all about him. It's all about his image and all. And, and what happens in the movie is that he is forced to go back to a certain moment that happened to him when he was eight years old where he realized in a very powerful way he heard, I am not. And so for the next 32 years, he said, I will prove that I am. His job what he did, the way he did it, his entire life of 32 years was dominated by that one I am not. And the movie is about him going back and getting to grips with that and getting some healing. That's the way it is. We are who we are in Jesus is that we've been exalted, we've been included, we've been loved, we've been claimed, we've been cleaned. We have a relationship with the Father that will never evaporate. It's a relation in Jesus. He will never forsake us. He will never leave us. And that's who we really are, according to the Bible, according to the gospel. But then we got who we believe we are, 
and all the years of habits of acting out of that. See, because you get family habits. You know, families believe and I am not, and they have certain sort of, you know, ways of coping with that, and it gets passed on from generation to generation. We kind of grow up in it and think it's normal. But it's really not normal. It's really the fruit of darkness, and you see? And it takes a while, and it takes courage for someone to stand up and say, I believe in Jesus, and I want to deal with this stuff, and I want to deal with all of this, and I want to get this turned around. I really want to repent. I want to have my spiritual knowledge healed, and I want to come back around to a full understanding so I can live in the hope and the peace and the joy of the gospel. The evil one has lots of tricks and ways in which he comes at us. Those looks like that lady that day, um, the, the, what is never said, may be your father, may be something your father said, it may be something your father never said. Maybe something your husband said, maybe something. Now, there's lots and lots of ways that the evil one, he's paying attention, and he takes those words of rejection, he grabs hold of them, and he gets them right in there, and he just whispers, and he knows how to do it. He knows exactly how to punch that button, and we nose dive, and then boom, there it is. You see that? You see how that works? So people say, well, Baxter's got everybody reconciled in God. They just don't know it. I'm thinking, yeah, we don't know it. And we're living in darkness and all this stuff is being, you know, owned to our family and friends and it's just creating chaos and bitterness and destruction. And the Holy Spirit's been sent into the world to bear witness to our spirits that we are. A fight of faith is believing the witness of the Spirit. It's like manna in the Old Testament. It doesn't keep. You don't get this in 1975 at a Billy Graham crusade and that's it. That's not how it works. It is manna. You receive it, you eat it, you feed on the Word every day. And the Word that you feed on is the Word of Jesus. Who is Jesus? Jesus is the Father's beloved Son who's gathered the whole human race in Himself and seated us with the Father at His right hand. So today, believing in Jesus means that I see Him at the Father's right hand and I see myself there with Him. Now, do you think Jesus is afraid? Seated at the Father's hand, is he anxious for tomorrow? Is he smitten with anxiety for the future? What's he experience? You know, so he, we have the same relationship with God that Jesus does. Whatever it is that the Father thinks of Jesus, he thinks of us because we're in that. You see that? We have the same standing, the same place. The blessings that the Father has poured forth on the Son are blessings that have been given to us. That's why Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us. Not will bless us when we get our religion right. Who has blessed us. You begin the fight of faith from the perspective of the gospel. The facts. God was in Christ reconciling the world. God laid hold of me in Jesus and cleansed me and took me home. I belong to God in Jesus. That's not dependent upon me. You know, you think about this if-then gospel that you hear preached all the time. I hear, I hear it back home. Jesus is the Lamb of God and takes away the sin of the world. And he will take away your sin too, if. And you're sitting over here thinking, now, did he take away the sin of the world? Or is it he will take away my sin if? And if it's he will take away my sin if, if what? If I do what? And how do I know that I've done this exactly the right way so that my sin is then taken away? And now I'm on the hamster's wheel. Now, I'm just, uh, uh, you know, what am I going to say when the evil one comes and says, I am not? That's right, I'm not, but I'm trying to be. You know, I'm getting there. We, we, it's, there's no way to go. If it's not objectively real in Jesus Christ, you don't have anything to believe that's not in the end dependent upon you. If your faith creates a relationship with God, then what you believe in is your faith. And the evil one's going to come in there and say, hey, how do you know that's real faith? You, you think you are a believer? You got the pure faith that gets you in that circle? Really? How about yesterday? You're sitting duck. There's nowhere to go. You have to turn in upon yourself, and then you don't have any basis for any hope, any assurance. The gospel is God was in Christ laying hold of Baxter and us and bringing us home, and he did it. Faith discovers it as truth, and acknowledges it and begins to receive it. Now that gives me hope because it's not created by me. It's not created by you. You see how that works? It's created by God and we're told about it. 
So every day, that manna, that spiritual manna, is that we go back to the truth. And every day when we're getting hammered by the evil one and his innuendos, we have to go back to the truth. We have to face our pain, face the, the lady in the car, and say to her, wait a minute, you don't know who I am, and you're not in a position to evaluate who I am. The only person that evaluates me and tells me who I am is God the Father. And he says, I'm a beloved child in Jesus, no matter what kind of car I drive. You see? Now, in that moment, it's a crisis of faith. What am I going to believe about God, and what am I going to believe about myself? The evil one says, no, you're not. You're not inside this circle of the relationship of the Father, Son, and Spirit. You're not included in that circle. You're out here, and you're trying to become, if you blah, 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 and you just nosedive. Now, you pay attention to this, and you'll see this. You ask God to help you to see how this works in your life. If you're honest and you're willing to embrace a little pain here, you will find tremendous relief and healing. And what happens inside of you when you begin to feed on the truth? You begin to see Jesus at the Father's right hand, as Paul says in Ephesians 2, and see yourself bound up in that relationship. What does that produce here? It produces hope. Produces those basic vital things, peace, joy, assurance. The New Testament calls it parousia, confidence, freedom, boldness. And that confidence and that freedom begins to work its way out in you and in your life, everywhere you go, whether it's on a soccer field or a cricket pitch. Where's Wes? Is it cricket? He's in the other building. Wherever you go, you're going now as a person who's got peace and hope and assurance. And you're not sending out fix me vibes. You know, you're not saying fix me, fix me, fix me. And you're not looking for something that you can attach yourself to that will save you like religion or money or a new car or a new position, a new house or whatever that you can go and pursue. You're going into those relationships as a person with a little bit of that fountain flowing. And what the kids on the baseball field encounter in that person is not a person who's demanding that they be perfect baseball players for the coach's benefit or the mama's and daddy's benefit. The coach is saying, I'm going to set you free to play. You see how that works? And that freedom to play is nothing other than the freedom in the life of the Father, Son, and Spirit. It's the Trinity coming to expression there on the baseball field. Or it's, a trin it's the life and freedom of the Father, Son, and Spirit coming to expression in our marriage, in our relationship. We hadn't done anything. You see what I'm saying? If you've laid hold of the truth and it's beginning to bring healing, you begin to have real relationships with people. You cannot manufacture that. You cannot program that. You cannot come up with a committee that will devise ten principles to produce that fellowship. It works by knowing the truth, producing that hope and assurance within us, and it sets us free to be ourselves. <laughs> sets us free to be funny. You know? Sets us free to be creative. May set some of us free to preach. May set some of us free to cook. I had dinner the other night at the Red Ochre. I'm real glad that Andrew Filkey's got enough freedom. Of oh, Jesus, have you eaten there? And you want to talk about the Trinity, there it is. I'm not joking. How can you eat a meal like that and not see that it starts in that circle and it's trying to express itself? What kind of meals are we going to have in heaven? You see how that works? It's the absolutely simplest thing in the world and at the same time the most beautiful thing. And at the same time the most difficult because we have really got a very warped view of God it keeps us from really being able to believe the gospel. And we can't take it into, my, into our souls, so we really can't let that assurance sink down and take root. So we're really not being able to make too much more progress in life than anybody else around us. You know, So we've got to go back, undo that vision of God, put the Trinity in there, begin to see the Father smiling at the Son, and the Son smiling at the Father in that laughing relationship and and that fullness and begin to realize the whole reason I'm here is to be included and that's who I am. That begins to bathe our souls and begins to create the kingdom out in front of our eyes. And again, the most remarkable thing about it is we still haven't done anything. It's about filling. It's about us being filled and overflowing and that going everywhere ever we go. Now the New Testament calls that light. 
It says folks out over here in the world who are included in that relationship, they know somehow deep inside they're made for glory because that's who they are. They can't find it. They're looking for it everywhere, and they don't know what to call it. They don't know how to name it. They don't know, but they know it's not this. And they're looking for the manifestations of that fellowship. They're not looking for the manifestations of thunder and lightning and miraculous acts of God. They're looking for the relationship of the Father and Son expressing itself in our marriages. They're just watching. They want to see the guy or the gal who's the boss, who's got a little bit of peace, and they're drawn to it. See how that works? They're just drawn to it because we're all wired for it. We're all looking for it. Now, what we've done, if we're honest with ourselves, in the Western world is we've created a religion that tries to manufacture the kingdom, and it's not the real kingdom. It, it got the right words, got the right actions, but there's not much river. And we're kind of mad at the world because they're looking over at us and think, well, that's not it. Let's move on over here. And they're, they're not looking at our words and our actions. They're looking for that reality. And that's where God's calling us back to. He's saying, I want my people to rest. I want my people to come back to know who Jesus is, who they are in Jesus, and find rest, as Jesus says, for their souls. Jesus says, for their souls. And in that rest, a freedom comes for life. And that freedom for life will manifest itself, and people will see it. And they're going to come and want to know what it is. We still haven't done anything <laughs> except believe the truth. And that's what Jesus says, the one work that you must do is to believe in Jesus. Our problem is when we try to believe in Jesus, he doesn't have us with him. He's just another individual up there. We're still here trying to figure out how to get Jesus in our life. We hadn't seen that magnificent New Testament you know, declaration that Jesus is Lord. He's already gathered hold of us. So I will leave you with this thought. If you can say the name of Jesus Christ and not at the same time say your name, you have not spoken of the real Jesus. If you can speak the name of Jesus and not speak the name of every other human being, you have not spoken the name of the biblical Jesus. Because the only Jesus the New Testament knows is the Jesus that has taken the entire world back to his Father. Amen.